So every other year, uh, the Institut de Biologie uh, this, uh, gives out the uh, Nakasani Award. And uh, this year, on a proposal by Jean-Louis Mandel, uh, it will go uh, uh, to Hélène Pussiot for her work on Friedrich Ataxia. So she has worked uh, on this disease for the past 15 years at last, covering many, many aspects of uh, genetics, of course, but also cell biology, uh, uh, farm, um, biochemistry, and even more recently, experimental therapeutics that have allowed her to demonstrate the essential role of uh, the loss of the gene causing this disease, uh, frataxin, in the assembly of iron sulfur uh, centers in mitochondria, resulting in cell death and uh, more recently to develop gene therapy approaches, uh, models of this disease. So after, as uh, we say, a very short discussion among the professors, uh, this uh, award is, uh, is happily, <laughs> reasonably short, <laughs> reasonably short. Uh, we'll go to Hélène uh, with our greatest. Okay, well, I'd like to, um, I guess, thank uh, Jean-Louis Mandel, who's not here, for, <laughs> for suggesting me, but I would like to thank all of you for, um, after a short or long discussion, accepting um, his proposition, and I'd like to thank you for um, on a kind introduction, um, and all of you for this very, um, very nice day, which I very varied, um, a lot of variation in, in the topics, but I found very interesting. So um, today what I'm going to try to do a little bit is give you um, some of the more recent work that we've been doing on uh, Friedrich Ataxia um, and trying to understand both the physiopathology of the disease but um, also going towards more therapeutic approaches. So uh, Friedrich Ataxia is the most common recessive ataxia. So ataxia is loss of coordination of movement. It affects 1 in 30,000 um, people in the Caucasian population. It's a progressive mixed spinocerebral and sensory ataxia. So the sensory ataxia is the loss of uh, uh, information coming from the position of the body and the spinocerebral is actually all the efferent uh, uh, information going uh, to the cerebellum. In addition to this primary uh, neurodegenerative disorder, there's also a primary hypertrophic cardiomyopathy associated to the disease and actually it's the most common cause of death in uh, patients with um, um, more than 60% uh, of the patient dying before the age of 25 of cardiomyopathy. And in addition, there's also an in increased incidence in diabetes, about 20% in patients. So in terms of the mutation, it's a very particular mutation that was identified um, by Michel Koenig and uh, Jean-Louis Mandel in 1996. It's uh, one of the uh, triplet repeat uh, uh, mutation, but it's a GAA expansion mutation, which is found in the intron of the gene, so it's not non-coding. And in FA patients, the triplet repeat mutation raises from between 100 to 1,000, and this leads to what we now know as a uh, heterochromatization of the locus, which leading to transcriptional silencing and uh, loss of frataxin. What's important to uh, uh, understand is that all FA patients have at least some residual frataxin, um, which is normal with no mutation within the coding uh, sequence, and this is thought to be between 5 and 10% um, of, of residual frataxin. This is what you can see here on a Western blot analysis, either in cerebral cortex or in cerebral cortex from uh, two patients or control, you see this very low level of frataxin um, in these patients. So in terms of the physiopathology, what do we know about this absence of frataxin? Um, we, um, it's from a very, very early on after the, the identification of the gene, and actually some of it before the identification of the gene, there were several um, uh, common um, things that were known in terms of the physiopathology. There was iron accumulation within the cardiomyocytes, so you can see here the blue pearl staining, which is iron accumulation within the cardiomyocytes. Uh, the, um, very early on, right after the gene identification, the um, team of Pierre Hustin Arnold Munich, actually at Necker, had uh, found that there was a specific deficit in iron sulfur clutter enzyme. These are uh, enzymes that are important for the respiratory chain of the mitochondria and also the Krebs cycle, such as complex one and two, three of the, comp uh, the respiratory chain and aconitase. And there was also uh, some um, thoughts or some um, uh, markers of increased sensitive to oxygen stress or markers of oxygen stress in the urine and in blood. And so this led for a long time to this idea that 
uh, for toxin deficiency led to this vicious uh, uh, circle where iron accumulation, for example, could do, lead to oxidative stress to fenton's reaction and lead to iron uh, cluster deficit, which these are these enzymes are very sensitive to oxidative stress, which would further uh, dysregulate iron and lead to iron accumulation. And so this has been um, uh, an important paradigm within the disease. And actually, a lot of the therapeutic approaches at first were uh, trying to look at these different uh, um, uh, parts, and in particularly antioxidants to combat the oxidative stress and uh, iron chelators to combat the iron accumulation. I'll come back to this uh, in, during my talk. So what do we know about frataxin? Um, so uh, actually a lot of work has been done since the identification in 1996. Nothing was known about the, the sequence when it was identified, except that it was highly conserved from, all, from the uh, 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 gram-negative bacteria all the way to humans. Um, it was a, it's a ubiquitously expressed mitochondrial protein. Uh, it's highly conserved, as I said. In terms of the uh, structure, it has this uh, unusual um, or unique fold, uh, which is unique to only the frataxin gene family, with this beta sheets on this side and these alpha helix. It was shown very, very rapidly after the identification that it was actually were able to bind iron along uh, the acidic ridge of, um, um, of the alpha helix there. So the exact function of frataxin, although it was unclear uh, for many and very controllable for many years, we, we knew it was very closely linked to iron homostatus and mitochondrial iron, iron homostatus since the beginning. And so, for example, here's a null scheme of the function of the, or the various function that frataxin was involved with. So iron is actually very important within the mitochondria. There's, um, so frataxin was proposed to be involved in iron storage, was supposed to be as a, or proposed to be involved as an iron donor for heme biosynthesis or as an iron donor for iron cluster, um, suffer, iron cluster suffer, uh, iron sulfur cluster biosynthesis, or even in repair. So um, the work of many different labs, including my lab, has, uh, along the years, been able to identify that the primary function of frataxin is actually in iron sulfur cluster biosynthesis. So what are iron sulfur cluster? Very quickly, these are very uh, redox active cofactors. They're actually very anxious cofactors. Um, and we heard this morning actually that maybe some of the membranes were due, the, the, before the lipids, maybe iron sulfur were there for the membranes. But, um, and so, but in the mammalian system or the eukaryotic system, they're important for electron transport, enzyme catalysis, gene regulation, and actually every important cellular pathway uh, that you look into um, the, the mammalian system or the eukaryotic system, there's an iron sulfur cluster protein in it. The, uh, the, the come here are the common iron sulfur cluster um, 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 cofactors that you can find in nature. And to actually make these, it's a very complex biosynthesis process that involves over 20 uh, proteins within the mitochondria. And then there's actually a whole relay, again, then in the cytosol uh, to, make, um, to continue making the iron sulfur clusters for the cytosol and the nucleus. So what we know, and this is a very uh, schematic and uh, um, um, a uh, picture of just the de novo, so the initial step of iron sulfur cluster protein. What we know now is that iron sulfur cluster protein happens on this de novo complex in which there's a cystine disulfurase, NFS1, which brings in the sulfur. Um, and there's a scaffold protein, ISQ, which is here in blue, and that's where the iron sulfur cluster will be um, um, built upon. And we now know that frataxin is involved in regulating the uh, cluster assembly on ISQ by allowing the activation of the cystine disulfurase in order to get the sulfur and at the same time allowing iron uh, entry into the complex. Once the, once the iron sulfur cluster uh, is built on ISQ, then it's moved on to a whole, by a whole series of chaperones to the APR proteins within uh, the mitochondria, or uh, something is built outside of the mitochondria uh, from this de novo um, biosynthesis machinery for all the iron sulfur cluster outside the mitochondria, which are the cytosolic and nuclear. So it is clear now that frataxin is involved in the regulation of this iron sulfur cluster uh, protein biosynthesis. So um, the, the, the approach that we've been taking in a lab to try to understand the physiopathology and to understand uh, um, um, uh, iron sulfur cluster uh, or Friedrich ataxia is to generate cellular and mouse models. But in parallel, we also, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, worked a lot on trying to understand the protein function through biochemical uh, approaches. And then um, the, the, the big, uh, I think the biggest strength of the lab is using the mouse model to try to understand the physiological mechanism involved, and then with the, always the end, end thought of going towards a therapeutic approach. And so over the years, 
we generated many different mouse models for uh, Critters ataxia. So originally we did a constitutive knockout um, and that was embryonic lethal at 6.5 uh, uh, embryonic day. And so then we moved towards a conditional uh, knockout. So these are organ specific deletion for taxin. This is using the Cree lock system in which uh, if we have lox P sites around the exons here in exon four of the for taxin gene, and then we can express under uh, tissue specific promoter or uh, Cree, um, the Cree recombinase, and then it will actually delete in between the two lox P sites leading to a tissue specific uh, uh, deletion of for taxin. So these are models that are much more severe than the humans. So humans, remember, have this GAA expansion, which leads to residual amount of frataxin all throughout the body. Here, we're deleting specifically for, or completely frataxin in specific cell types. So there are um, models, they're not perfect models, but they're good models uh, to understand some of the uh, effect, but there are more severe models also, and this is to keep in mind. Um, and so we've generated, as you can see here, a variety of models, whether they've been uh, cardiac models or neuronal models of the disease, to try to uh, uh, dissect um, the physiopathological pathway. And without going through uh, all the different models that we've done, um, a very brief uh, overview of what they enable us to do. And so most of these models actually have reproduced most of the important pathophysiological and biochemical uh, features of uh, friotaxia. So for example, the cardiac model um, develops a progressive cardiomyopathy. Um, they have a deficient activity in the iron sulfur cluster protein, and this is actually both in the respiratory chain, but also in the quantities as was shown in humans, but also in other iron sulfur cluster proteins. They have mitochondrial iron accumulation. You can see here this dark um, accumulation of mitochondrial of iron within the mitochondria that's actually uh, not very healthy. The neuronal model um, uh, have a progressive mixed cerebral and sensory ataxia with a progressive loss of proprioceptions. And so these models have been extremely good at demonstrating the early, what, what are the early pathways involved uh, in the disease. And at the same time as we were working on the biochemical approach to understand the frontal or the function of frataxin, this clearly led us to the fact that the early primary pathophysiological event of the loss of frataxin was iron sulfur cl cluster deficit, and that the iron uh, homeostatic dysregulation came further on, and that if there is oxidative stress or at cell death happens after the, uh, all these events. So there was first an iron sulfur cluster biosynthesis uh, dysfunction, the mitochondrial dysfunction, iron accumulation leading to um, uh, cell death. Um, and so this is, um, I guess, a, 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 a simplified schematic on, on what we believe now happens at, in the absence of frataxin. But one of the questions that actually, uh, so this is important for, for therapeutic consequences if, you, if we want to think about therapeutic. And I said that the earliest therapeutic uh, approach actually were antioxidants very early on, uh, actually a year or two after the gene was identified. Um, and so you can see that antioxidants are actually very far down in terms of of where um, uh, they are in, in the scheme of the pathophysiology. Um, so there's been um, a lot of antioxidant strategies, a lot of uh, strategies that are around either iron chelation or increasing mitochondrial bio, uh, biogenesis and function. And more recently, there's been a lot of efforts towards trying to upregulate for taxin either by uh, modulating the epigenetic environment by using hashtag inhibitors or by, um, for example, protein or gene therapy. So today I want to talk about two uh, approaches um, or two, two, two studies that we've done in the lab uh, that enables us to kind of address a little bit this therapeutic approach. The first uh, question that we uh, wanted to raise in the, in the lab is trying to understand really um, the source of iron, the iron um, accumulation and, and what was the consequence of this iron accumulation. And this was really important because in our animal models, we had no sign of uh, oxidative damage. And so we were really wondering whether this iron ore overload really led to Fenton's reaction. And this was important in terms of iron chelators, if this iron overload was uh, toxic or not, and whether we should or not use iron chelators. And so the way we approach this is actually using uh, the mouse to approach this. And so really the question we were asking is we knew that uh, iron accumulation occurred. But we're wondering whether uh, this actually led to oxidative stress, uh, whether this was actually a toxicity effect, whether this contributed to mitochondrial dysfunction or even iron sulfur cluster deficit, and how that was related to uh, the pathophysiology of the disease. And so um, the hypothesis that we had was the fact that there was probably an iron, the iron regulatory proteins involved. And why the iron regulatory proteins? So RP, there's two iron regulatory proteins. There are RP1 and RP2. RP1 actually exists in two states in, in, the, uh, in the cell. 
when it when their cell is plenished with uh, iron and actually when there's making iron sulfur cluster, it exists as a uh, cytosolic actinase. We don't know what the activity of the cytosolic actinase is, but this is the, the form it exists. And so actually, in most uh, in most of the time throughout um, uh, the 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 day of the the body, uh, whether it's a human or the, or the mouse, uh, it actually exists as a cytosolic actinase. And um, when there is a deficiency in uh, iron or deficiency in iron sulfur cluster protein, it goes into this IRP1 um, 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 uh, form. And this IRP1, like IRP2, are able to find these uh, IRE elements, so these stem looped uh, structures that are found on mRNAs. And uh, they will have an action on the whole cellular iron homeostasis. And so, for example, when the, they bind to a stem loop that is in the 3 prime N of the gene, um, that will lead to stabilization of the mRNA and therefore increase um, uh, translation of this uh, uh, of the of the gene encoding. And this is actually what happens on uh, important um, genes that are in, that are in, implicated in cellular iron import. And particularly, for example, the transferring receptor one um, receptor has uh, has an IRE on its uh, three prime aim. On the other hand, if you have an IRE on its five prime and the five prime N of the uh, mRNA, this will actually, with IRP1 or IRP2 binding to this IRE, this will block uh, the translation, and so then will actually lead to less expression of um, the gene involved. And actually, here this is a case for cellular iron storage, where you'll have less expression of ferritin. So, if you have less iron you will be in an IRP1 uh, or IRP2 conformation, and so you will go into cellular import of iron and decreasing iron storage, which will then replenish the iron within the cell, and then once it's replenished within the cell, IRP2 will be degraded in an iron-dependent proteosomal degradation pathway, and IRP1 will go back into uh, an iron sulfur cluster protein, so the cytosolic acinitase. And so our hypothesis was that this might be involved in the iron accumulation. So the first thing we did is we generated liver-specific uh, knockout for frataxin. So why liver? Because liver is not really affected, or we don't think it's affected, although it might be sub subsequently affected in, in patients. But liver is an important uh, area for um, um, iron homeostasis. And so we see when we delete frataxin in the liver, the first effect is an iron sulfur cluster deficit. Here you can see SDH as a mitochondrial uh, example, or for example, NTH1 as a nuclear example. And then um, very quickly, the liver, um, the, the mass actually goes through liver failure with lipid accumulation, a drastic here uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, and a drastic mitochondrial iron accumulation, as you can see here, by four weeks of age. And as um, I explained to you before, in the absence of iron sulfur cluster proteins, IRP1 becomes an IRE binding uh, or IRE binding elements, and using an MSA assay where we have an IRE probe. Um, that is radio label. You can see that we have an activation of the IRP1 activity at 14 days of age in the mutant animals compared to the control. So, as I said, our hypothesis that was that maybe IRP1 was responsible for this massive iron accumulation, and so we generated double IRP1 for toxin knockout. Just to know that IRP1 knockout have no uh, phenotype at all in the normal condition in the in the laboratory. And so the first thing that we saw when we donated um, double knockouts is that you can see here the double knockout in pink have actually a highly reduced lifespan compared to the single knockout animals. So um, Alain actually took a, a, did a lot of experiments at 23 days of, day of age, so right before the rapid loss of these animals. And so what the first thing he noticed is that at 23 days of age, if he looked at um, markers of liver dysfunction, you can see here in a single knockout versus a double knockout, the markers of liver dysfunction here as ALAT is actually, they're highly increased, so really showing that the liver function is more affected in the absence of RP1, which fits actually with the um, very reduced lifespan. He then looked by um, different means, and here I'm showing you by electron microscopy um, the, 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 the mitochondria function. So he can see that here are mitochondria. So while the mitochondria at 23 days in the single knockout is relatively, uh, relatively normal, in a du double knockout uh, they're extremely abnormal, they're very enlarged, and they've lost their central crystra. So IRP1 sustains the mitochondria function in uh, for taxon deficiency. 
We then look at um, the um, iron homeostasis. And so here I just reminded you what I showed you earlier. And so just so you say when we go into the IRP1, we have an increase in, we should have an increase in uh, transferring receptor 1. And so you can see here in the absence of protaxin, we have this increase in transferring receptor 1 and a decrease in the uh, cellular iron storage protein ferritin L. And in a, our double knockout, you can see that we are losing this increase. So we still have some, so there's still a second mechanism to sustain iron still in the, in the cell, or, uh, in the cell. Um, but it's very much decreased, as you can see here, um, compared to um, the single knockout. So IRP1 sustain iron import. Um, and then when we look at uh, iron content, uh, mitochondrial iron content, you can see actually that in the absence of IRP1, we have less mitochondrial content. And this is at 23 days of age, but I had shown you that the iron content was increasing for taxon deficiency at, at more at four weeks of age. And so if we look at 28 uh, weeks, days of age, here we see in single for taxon knockout, a higher amount of, uh, for tax, of iron accumulation within the mitochondria. There is a massive decrease of this iron accumulation within um, the double knockout uh, mice. So um, IRP1 contributes to mitochondria iron accumulation for taxon deficiency. So um, what is the conclusion of this, uh, um, of this uh, study? So first of all, it enabled us to understand what are the molecular, mar uh, 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 molecular uh, players in the iron accumulation. Um, and so as I just said, in the absence of frataxin, we have deficit in iron sulfur cluster biogenesis, which leads to an IRP1 activation, which increases um, the transferring receptor 1 would leading to increase in the iron import. I haven't shown you the, uh, today, but we've also shown that uh, the mitoferrin uh, 2 uh, is in involved in, in doing the, iron, the mitochondrial iron import. Uh, and then this leads to um, actually um, uh, accumulation of iron within the uh, mitochondria. So, and clearly IRP1 is necessary to sustain that. But what we have also seen is that in the absence of IRP1, so when we prevent this iron uh, uh, accumulation or this iron import, it's actually very bad for the cell. And so we actually think that this also tells us that the use of iron chelators in therapeutic approach for FA should actually be considered with caution. And actually there's been a lot of different uh, um, um, clinical essays that have been stopped because iron, uh, iron chelators have been detrimental in uh, FA patients. Um, what about other tissues that are affected in NFA? So we're currently trying to understand whether this also occurs in heart and neurons because uh, these, of course, are tissues that are affected also in FA patients. So um, as I said, so that was the first story I want to tell you is this, this um, idea of how does iron accumulation and what's the role of iron. And so we think that it's actually this iron accumulation is a protective effect of, of wanting to try to get more iron in to try to sustain uh, mitochondrial function in iron sulfur cluster biosynthesis. The second story I want to talk to you about um, is a more recent story that, um, which is um, the approach of gene therapy for free ataxia. And so, um, why gene therapy? Uh, it's an autosomal recessive uh, uh, disease. It has a postnatal onset with a slowly prog slow progression, so we believe this is a therapeutic window. There's a residual amount of frataxin uh, expression in patients, so they're not going to get an immune response against and uh, us bring back frataxin. Um, and frataxin is a small uh, protein, so it fits in, in many of the viral um, uh, vectors that are out there. And, and more, more uh, importantly, we know that we probably don't need much frataxin protein in order to be, uh, have a therapeutic effect. And this is what we know is, uh, so heter heterozygous carriers, first of all, 50% of frataxin have no uh, disease. But we also have animal models with, uh, that have been generating using the GEA expansion. Um, and they have about 20% amount of frataxin, and an animal model with 20% of frataxin has no phenotype, even under stress, in their, even under um, iron overload. Uh, so we actually think that we don't need much frataxin for it to be efficient. So uh, we embarked uh, on this adventure a few years ago, and so we used um, uh, AAV vectors. Um, um, because they had, we, we thought they presented several advantages for gene therapy. They're non-enveloped, single-stranded uh, DNA. There's a, over 14 different serotypes uh, with different tropism, in particular in the RNR interest. There's actually two serotypes, RH10 and AV9, which are known to target the heart and the, and the neurons, in particular the dorsal reganglia, which uh, are affected in, in FA. 
Um, they, trans the, they transduce post-mitotic cells, which are the cells in, uh, um, in, of interest in the FA, and um, they show very low amino and genotoxicity in vivo. So um, we, uh, the, one of the disadvantages they have is that they have a very small cargo capacity, but Fotaxin is a very small gene, so this actually does not uh, prevent or makes a problem for us. So what are the two target tissues that we want to target? As I said, the heart is of interest and also the dorsal root ganglia here along the spinal cord, which are actually necessary for, or that, that harbor the, 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 the sensory neurons. So um, we made a um, first proof of concept um, that gene therapy would be very useful for the cardiomyopathy associated with Friedrich's ataxia. This was an intravenous injection of an ARCH10 uh, that expressed human frataxin and improved uh, uh, survival and growth, rapid normalization of the left ventricle function and remodeling even in uh, mouse that, had a, uh, that were in heart failure, so very, very advanced in their, in their disease. Um, and then actually with a very rapid rescue. And so this start, showed us that there was a large therapeutic window. And so since uh, we've published this, it's actually advanced quite a bit. And I'm just gonna give you just an, a, an update of the advanced. It's been licensed to a um, uh, pharma company. Uh, we've actually performed a dose response study and we've been able to show to my biggest surprise uh, that if we correct only 50% of the cardiac cells, that's enough to uh, maintain normal cardiac function and to correct cardiac function. So that's a, a very interesting to think that only 50% of cells can be corrected and you still have, or a mouse at least still has normal cardiac function. And so now um, the pharma is actually uh, ongoing with toxicity studies on what, what would happen with overexpression of frataxin and studies in large animals for delivery method and we're testing the uh, clinical vector. And so the hope here is that this pharma will bring uh, this uh, vector into first clinical trials in 2018. So that's their prediction. Um, when it happens, I'll tell you that it's happening because I think that <laughs> predictions are very, very positive. <laughs> So what I do want to talk to you about today is some of our unpublished work on what we've been doing. So that was a cardiac aspect. And so even though the cardiac aspect is important because 60% um, um, of the patients die of the, of the, cardi of the cardiomyopathy, um, the neuronal aspect of the disease is actually very important also in terms of uh, quality of life uh, for these patients. And so um, as I said, one of, one of the primary uh, uh, neurons that is degenerating in, this, in, in these, in these um, uh, humans is the sensory neurons, and so these are the, pr the large proprioceptive neurons you can see here that are in the DRGs. This is actually a very small population of the neurons in the DRGs. You can see here in patients the absence of these large proprioceptive neurons, and these are the neurons that actually bring back the information from the position of uh, your, your, your body uh, towards, uh, to your, uh, uh, your cerebellum and, your, and cerebral cortex. And so these, it's actually extremely important for the uh, um, position and, and, and coordination of your movements. Um, so uh, to do that, we generate a new uh, neuronal model in which we try to specifically uh, deplete for taxin in these proprioceptive neurons. And actually, the uh, parvalbumin uh, Cree mice actually has uh, that capacity. You can see here a dorsal root ganglia where you can see expression of the Cree here on the lag Z uh, very early on, P8 already in the large proprioceptive neurons of the dorsal root ganglia. And we actually do also get um, expression in the Purkinje cell layer of the cerebellum, but this is much later on at P40. So again, not a perfect model, but a good model because the early, the early part is really a sensory uh, part. And so we've been doing a lot of uh, different behavior tests with these animals. As you can hear on the notch bar, we, we look at them, their capacity of the mouse to walk on the notch bar. You can see the um, mutant animals over the time uh, make more and more mistakes with the capability of uh, walking on this notch bar compared to wild type animals. We can look at the string test, which evaluates much more of the peripheral coordination. And again, you can see it's less sensitive than the notch bar, so it only starts around six. 0.5 or 7 weeks of age, but again, we can see a, um, a progressive uh, loss of coordination on uh, this uh, string test. Um, and then we can actually do some electrophysiology to look at the specifically uh, the sensory wave, and so by stimulating the cytic nerve, uh, which is a mixed nerve, then we can record both the M wave, which is the motor wave directly, but then we can also record the H wave, which is a sensory wave, and it gives us really a good idea of what are the sensory uh, 
uh, wave or sensory uh, neurons um, um, function or not. And so, as you can see here, here's the motor wave, so there's no motor uh, defect. But if we look at the sensory wave, we see that there's already at 4.5 weeks of age, there's a decrease in sensory wave, and this actually decreased to completely disappear by 10 weeks of age. And so this is uh, a very specific sensory uh, uh, defect. And again, if we look at neuronal loss, and so here's just one of the counts, but there's many different other ways of counting. Uh, here's if we count globally all the numbers of neurons per area in the dorsal ganglia, we get to see that we have a decrease of 14% about of neurons, and we now know that these actually correspond to the large proprioceptive neurons. Um, and this occurs about 10.5 weeks of age. So of interest for the, the, the patients, um, even though um, there's a very strong uh, uh, dysfunction in the sensory neurons early on, uh, the neurons are still there. And so that's actually important for correction, or if we want to come with correction. So we did some um, uh, therapeutic approach using gene therapy. So uh, we first started with presymptomatic. Um, and so this is a very early um, uh, treatment at 3.5 weeks of age. So although they do have a little phenotype, it's not a very strong phenotype. We treated at a very high dose of uh, vector. This was a systemic uh, administration using the AV9 under, uh, with um, the frataxin, the human frataxin gene under a uh, strong ubiquitous promoter. Um, and we followed the mice until 17.5 weeks of age. And so this is just to give you an idea. Um, so here's a wild type mice. So here's another uh, one of the, this is a normal bar test. You can see wild type mice has no problem walking on, uh, on this test. Um, uh, if I can. Here's a mutant uh, animal at eight weeks, so you can actually uh, notice that it's not doing as happy as the wild type mice, uh, and it's using its tail actually to balance itself, uh, uh, in addition to kind of hugging the, the bar. Um, and here's a uh, uh, KO animal, um, mutant animal that was treated, so at 3.5 weeks of age, so this is five weeks after treatment, if I can get the video. And so actually notice, look at the tail, because the tail really shows you, it really doesn't need its tail to balance itself anymore. So you don't have to be a, um, a, a mouse clinician to know that, that this mouse is doing better than the other one. So again, we have different ways of measuring this. So if we go back on the crenulated bar test, what you can see is that here's when we treated the animals. Actually, they were already affected on the crenulated bar. And actually, one week after, you can see we correct them. And we actually maintain them correct for quite a while. They do develop a little bit of a problem, and they actually start uh, trembling. And remember I said that we are um, actually de uh, deleting frataxin also in the Purkinje cell la cells later on. And we know that by IV injection, we actually don't cross completely the blood barrier, uh, brain barrier. So that actually makes sense, and so that's probably more of the Purkinje um, or the, the, the cerebellar phenotype or the, the, probably a little bit of the cortical phenotype coming up also. If we look at the string test, which strictly looks at the peripheral system, um, so um, you can see here, this is when we treated. Um, and again, it's less sensitive, so it's only around 7.5 weeks of age that we see something. But you see that we actually maintain them completely corrected all the way until 16.5 uh, weeks of age. Um, so this is a complete prevention of, the, uh, of this phenotype. And then if we look at um, the EMG, so the sensory uh, defect, um, so we can't actually do EMG before 4.5 weeks of age until the, the mouse is too small. But so the first point is one week after injection. So you can see that the untreated animals already have a defect where the treated animals are equivalent to wild type, and this is maintained. So we don't know if this is a correction or prevention because we don't have, we don't know what's happening before. Um, but this is ex extremely encouraging, uh, obviously. Uh, if we look at the, uh, dors uh, the, the neuronal loss in dorsal root ganglia, again, we also completely prevent the loss of dorsal root ganglia. And that actually uh, correlates with all the other phenotypes that we're seeing, that these mice complete, seem to be completely correct in, in terms of the sensory proprioceptive um, uh, effect. Um, and again, we can also go look at electron microscopy to see if we correct, correct or if we prevent uh, the degeneration that you see, uh, the axonal degeneration that you can see. So here's um, in the sensory uh, or in, in the cytic nerve, the um, sensory neurons, some of them are uh, myelinated, as you can see here, and some actually are in remake bundles. Um, and in KO animals, you can see actually a lot of degeneration of, degeneration of some of the myelinated um, um, uh, axons, you can see some, I don't know if you can see anything here, but there's uh, abnormal mitochondria in these small um, 
that, so the, the, these are the large myelinated axons, so these are the proprioceptive axon. And if we look actually, um, the treated KO, there's actually no defect that we can see uh, by electron microscopy. So it really looks like we've completely corrected uh, completely these animals. So um, that's great. Uh, we have generated this new model. Uh, we've been able to um, prevent the onset of the disease. Uh, we're obviously characterizing these models, and I haven't had a chance to show you all the molecular uh, markers that we have on trying to understand what's going on in these neurons and how they're degenerating, what are the pathways involved. Um, and it, this is clearly uh, some uh, very exciting uh, um, um, results. But patients, when they come, they already have a phenotype. So are we really interested in preventing or are we trying to, interested in trying to correct? And so as we did for the cardiac um, part, we also went on and looked at gene therapy um, uh, evaluation uh, for correction, so at later time points. And so I'll start with the video because the video is, so this is, it's post-symptomatic, so at 7.5 weeks of age. Here's a non-treated animal, so it's gonna take time to get going, so it has a hard time going on there. So um, you can see that this uh, untreated animal has actually really, really hard time going on that crenelated bar and doesn't really want to go. And when it goes, you see that it's making lots of mistakes. It's having a hard time uh, coordinating. It's actually not going forward um, very much. And so what we did is we actually treated uh, the mice at 7.5 weeks of age. We did two types of treatment in, at, on the same mice. Intravenous treatment with an injection, so the same as we did before, but to try to correct the cerebellar phenotype that was affecting um, we did some intracerebellar delivery, actually, with um, in the, uh, the cerebral, um, white matter and striatum and bi bilateral, so trying to cover as much as we could of the cerebellum and the cerebral um, phenotype. So here's um, a KO mice one week after treatment, so the same age as the other one, so although it's not completely normal, you can see that it's uh, doing much better, um, and so this was extremely en encouraging, uh, obviously. Um, so we continue, we have a big, large cohort of animals, so we analyze this cohort of animals. So here is on the notch bar test, the test that I just showed you. So here is before treatment, so you see that both cohorts of animals are affected, and at treatment, the untreated animals continue to progress, and the um, um, loss of coordination, while the uh, treated animals um, stop progressive. It kicks in and starts progressing a little bit, and again, I think this is the cerebral phenotype. We see them actually uh, trembling, and uh, we're probably not completely uh, correcting all of the cerebral phenotype. If we looked at the uh, strength test, so again, we're looking strictly at the peripheral uh, 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 phenotype. You can see this is at time of treatment, so this is the measurement before treatment, so you see both cohorts are equally affected. One week, one week after treatment, while the un- um, um, the untreated animals uh, have a hard time doing this uh, test. The untreated animals actually, uh, the treated animals uh, get corrected so they can actually get their, their feet back up on the strength test very quickly. And this is maintained all the way until uh, 20 weeks of age. And then finally, if we looked at the sensory defect, uh, so by EMG, and so this is really a functional uh, uh, effect. So here is prior to treatment, so you see again both cohorts are uh, uh, fully or, or, or nicely or very much affected on the sensory uh, uh, wave. Um, here is the intensity. After treatment, you can see the untreated animals actually collapse completely and, and, and have no sensory uh, wave, where the, untre the treated animals actually get back more sensory wave and to be maintained as in um, well type animals. So it looks like when we treat at 7.5 weeks of age, we're able to actually reverse uh, the sensory neuronal uh, phenotype. So of course, that's extremely encouraging. Um, and so now we're obviously continuing all this work. This is all ongoing work. Um, uh, we're trying to figure out also if the molecular uh, pathways are corrected. So we're, that's we're truly ongoing because we're, we're in the middle of it. And we're also trying to see how far we can go. So here we went at 7.5 weeks of age. So this is when we know we have no neuronal loss. We know the neuronal loss happens at 10.5 weeks of age. So right now we have a cohort of animals that are injected at 9.5 weeks of age to see if, yes or no, we can correct, if we can have partial correction uh, of the phenotype. And obviously then we'll follow up with those response studies and large animal studies um, with the hope of, of, of going towards uh, humans um, afterwards. So with that, I'd like to um, thank the people involved in this work. This has been a very big team effort. So. Um, 
the work I presented on IRP1 is actually the work of Alain uh, Martelly, who has uh, now left the, uh, the lab and is uh, working at Pfizer in Boston on uh, an FA gene therapy and, and uh, pharmacological approach. So that's actually quite interesting <laughs> uh, in, in, in direct competition with us, but it's fine. Um, uh, I know he's well trained, so I know they'll, they'll manage to do something. Morgan uh, and Brahim. Um, have been working on the cardiac uh, gene therapy approach and have been very good at doing this. Margaret is no longer with us, but Brian is continuing working. He's the one who's been doing all the dose response. And then on the neuronal uh, aspects, it's Charlene, uh, Françoise, Laurence, and Nadej who've been uh, pushing huge effort because this is work that actually started three years ago, so we've advanced quite uh, fast on this. And I'd like to thank all um, my many collaborators of the years, the finance, and you for your attention.